Welcome everybody to the world is a mess and I just wanted to steampunk it. This is episode 39, October 15th, 2021. And I'm your host, Steampunk Star Rays, and I'm here in North Hollywood, California. And I'm here with my co-host, Daniel Bertison from Bellwood, Ontario, Canada. So how's it going, Daniel? Uh, I'm doing good, yeah. Uh, I guess the first thing we could talk about, I just, I forgot that that was a news story. You had sent me the link the other day. William Shatner rode into space on an orbital spacecraft for Blue Origin. Uh, you know, the Blue Origin, I think, is owned by Jeff Bezos. Yeah, I think so. They're an aerospace. So hold on, let me share. Make make the uh, podcast a little bit more interesting, but yeah, the founder is Jeff Bezos. That's Jeff Bezos' company, Blue Origin. It's an American privately funded aerospace manufacturer, suborbital space flight. So the controversy with Blue Origin, though, you know, because this is a big publicity stunt. They got William Shatner, who's like 90 years old, to be uh, on this uh, rocket ship. And a lot of people argue that it's not even a, a true spacecraft because it doesn't actually go into space. It just goes into the high atmosphere. That's why it's called a suborbital space flight. So oh, I guess it depends space. on, yeah, it depends on what your definition of space is. Uh, there's a graphic here. I was so excited. I thought to myself, oh my God, Captain Kirk goes into space again. Well, I love Captain Kirk. I can't stand William Shatner. William Shatner is kind of a, kind of a jerk there. But yeah, can you see that? Um, I'm, I'm see sure that poster. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry, one second. It, it's, uh... What what what's going on, Daniel? Uh, my my computer's frozen for a second. Hold on frozen oh that's nice yeah incremental development yeah it's, sub, it's suborbital uh orbital transportation um successful pad escape test october uh 2012 crew capsule propulsion module yeah this reminds me of uh 1960s technology I mean, NASA had this technology back in the 60s. So this is not really as amazing um, as you would believe, but it's a suborbital program and, and flight testing stage. But yeah. William Shatner is an a-hole, but Captain Kirk is cool. That's all I can say. But don't confuse the two. The character of Captain Kirk is fictional. William Shatner is a real life a hole. But um, but yeah, I guess uh, we can move on to the next topic. First, I gotta say, like, hey, um, you know what? I think while up there, I think I think William Shatner. While he was up there, I think he went through a wormhole, ended up in the future, and met Captain Picard. How so? I mean, it's possible. But he, but he, 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 uh, he died in Star Trek Generations. He got, he got uh, captured by the, you know, he was on board of the Enterprise B, presumed dead. He went into the the Nexus, and then Picard got him out of the Nexus. And then he died fighting that one dude. Uh, what I can't remember that character's name. But um, so I don't see how that's possible. 
I think his name is Soren. Soren, that's right. That's a pretty cool villain. Um, I think Star Trek Generations is a very underrated movie. A lot of people say that the movie sucked and that the only Star Trek movie that was the only next generation movie that was good was uh, First Contact, but I disagree. I think that was a good movie as well. Um, you know, First, First Contact is my favorite next generation movie, but um star trek generations comes in a close second because it was a transitional movie yeah and um i didn't really like star trek nemesis because i thought it had too many plot holes and flaws and it just seemed really contrived way of, of killing off data um star trek insurrection was okay it had some flaws and some cheesy moments but it was at least still was a good star trek movie but yeah, so moving on to the Gabby Petito case, um, you know, my last podcast didn't get as many views because I was talking about computer tech stuff and I was talking about what if episodes eight and nine, but I guess, you know, I've noticed people like, like it when you talk about the juicy stuff, even though there hasn't really been too many updates. The only update, see, on yeah. Google, Gabby Petito okay, uh, update. The only update was three days ago. It was mentioned that her specific cause of death was strangulation. And that's interesting because, and it makes sense because he was a he was an abuser, you know, and that was partially caught on video from August the twelfth, and so her body must have been in good enough shape for them to determine that. Uh, Cause I know that some forensics experts suspected because her body had been laying out in the open in the desert for three weeks, that she may be either skeletonized or partially skeletonized. Cause it doesn't take long once, once uh, scavengers, you know, get a hold of the body, but amazingly, I, I guess her body was well-preserved. You know, she was laying out there for three weeks and uh it may either be bone fractures on her neck or or she had enough tissue left that showed there was some lacerations or whatever uh so it's interesting that they released that that the cause of death was strangulation um brian laundry is listed as a person of interest and there's been a slew of sightings hold on Well, this is on Fox News. I might as well share it. Because uh, it's the first thing that came up. Let's see. Fox News is only accurate when it comes to reporting the news. But 90% of the time, Fox News is not accurate because it's, a, it's mostly news opinion pieces. And a lot of people are not aware of that. So take that with a grain of salt. All right, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Gabby Petito autopsy paints grim picture of last moments, experts say. Killing somebody by strangulation is a long, deliberate process. Emergency doctor and expert witnesses. So, yeah, because I'm assuming that some people may have theorized that maybe he accidentally killed her or maybe she fell and died because she, uh, she was in Grand Teton, um, Wyoming. But no, uh, this was a deliberate murder, and it was definitely deliberate because he, he had to strangle somebody for a long time, like at least a couple of minutes before you kill them. But uh, because like if even if you strangle somebody for like a minute, they will come to, they might lose consciousness, but then they'll come to. Uh, mm -hmm. I've actually been strangled before. Uh, I've been a a victim of domestic abuse and i almost lost consciousness after only being strangled for 30 seconds but anyway um but that is a story for another day sticking on to the gabby petito case northport florida the gabby petito autopsy finding that she died by homicide died of homicide by strangulation indicates a likelihood of domestic violence and deadly intent 
at the Wyoming campsite where FBI led investigation uncovered her remains last month, experts tell Fox News. Her fiance, Brian Laundrie, who shared the campsite with her before driving back to Florida alone and ultimately disappearing himself, has been named a person of interest in her death and is wanted on a federal bank card fraud warrant. Uh, refresher for those of you who didn't uh, see my last podcast about this or, or maybe haven't been in the loop. Um, he supposedly took her debit card and withdrew like $1,000 worth of cash. That's how he was able to afford the gas to be able to drive from Wyoming all the way back to um, Northport, Florida. And he was booking it like, you know, she was killed on see Gabby Anyway, um, I'll, I'll bring up the Wikipedia article. I just wanted to do a brief reading at the beginning of that. And let me share. Yeah, so it hasn't been fully determined exactly what day she died, but she died between August the 27th and August 30th, 2021 according to this Wikipedia page. And I've also seen other sources that cite that as well. Um, the last time she talked to her mom was on August the 27th. So she was probably, probably killed on August the 27th, if I had to guess. And the problem is, is now that the, the reward money for finding Brian Laundry is up to $30,000. And I know that even his parents have even aided and embedded law enforcement in trying to look for him at his favorite campsites in that swamp in Florida. And uh, they still haven't been able to find him because I don't think he's there. I think he hitched a ride and went somewhere. But he's been, you know, when you, when you add that much reward money to it, then everybody's going to jump out of the woodworks and claim that they saw that person because they're hoping to collect the reward money. They hope that even if it's a one in a million chance of collecting the reward money, I'll, I'll, I'll report a tip in, even if it may be false. So, I mean, yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a pretty sad case. And I think it's pretty darn obvious that Brian Laundrie is guilty because he wouldn't have fled. But yeah, he, um, oh, getting back to the debit card fraud, he's, he took her debit card, pulled out $1,000. You're not allowed to pull out money from a dead person's debit card. You know, yeah. so that's an unauthorized transaction. And uh, more than likely, if I had to guess, he probably shaved his beard because there's all those pictures of him with a beard. And he is balding, so he shaved his head bald, but he may grow his hair out so that he can look like a totally different person. Um, uh, from what I understand, he loves to go to the Appalachian Trail, that he's, he's camped out in the Appalachian Trail for two months. And the Appalachian Trail is a really good place to get lost. The only problem he'll run into is when he starts to run low on food and supplies, he's going to have to come into civilization and risk getting caught. And so there is a warrant out for his arrest. So, um, but yeah, here's a picture of the National Forest where she was found dead. Okay, I'm gonna start, stop sharing that. But yeah, so it is a tragic case. Um, I don't believe he committed suicide because if he was going to commit suicide, he probably would have done it in Wyoming. Why take out $1,000 and then come back? So he's got $1,000 cash. If you're laying low and living off the land, that money could last several months because it's not like you're paying rent or utilities or anything. And he didn't take his cell phone, so it's impossible to track him. 
He's not on social media, or at least not recently. And there's a million people saying that they found, saw him in, from the Bahamas to Mexico to everywhere. Hold on. It was an interesting map. I'll bring up Brian Laundry. I think it was on the CNN page. It was really, it was an interesting little map showing you all the reports that have come in and obviously not all of them are correct. Do you watch CNN, Chris? Sometimes. I don't have cable TV. I watch it through YouTube clips and I watch it through CNN.com. I'm too poor for cable TV. But anyway. Uh, where was it? Man, hold on. Before I screen share, I wanted to show this map. If I can find it again, CNN's website is really convoluted. It's got so many graphics and so many advertisements, and it's really hard to find what you're looking for, even if you do a search for it. Let me search for Brian Laundry Sighting. map. I'll do a Google image search for that. Okay, this was on 247 News Around the World. Uh, come on. I'm going to share a map here. And we're going to come up with possible theories of where he might be. I'm leaning East Coast. Because like I said, if you're going to kill yourself because you're guilty of killing your girlfriend, why would you steal a thousand bucks out of her debit card and steal her van and drive it all the way back to Florida? You know, and unless you intend to lay low and escape. Let me share the screen again. Tell me if you can, can you see that? Um, hold on. I need you to pay attention, please. We don't have much time. Everything okay, okay Daniel? What's going on? Uh, my, my computer's frozen. Okay. Oh, that's a nice map. That's an interesting map, yeah. Yeah, those are all the sightings. You know, he's been sighted in New York. He's been, you know, sighted in... Kansas, Monument Rocks, supposedly. He's been sighted in Colorado and Utah. Uh, he, you know, and they also show where, you know, in Utah where the number four is August the 12th. So they have a little timeline here. Uh, number one, uh, they left, he left New York on July the 2nd with his girlfriend. On July the 2nd, he stopped in Kansas at Monument Rocks, or they, or both of them did. Um, and then number three, on uh, they took a road trip tour of Colorado and Utah. On uh, number four, on August the twelfth, they responded to domestic violence incident involving the couple. And number five, on August twenty fourth, Gabby Petito last seen at Salt Lake City Hotel with fiance. And then number six, August the twenty fifth. Final call the family saying that she was in Grand Teton National Park. And then number seven, 
uh, pear plan, Yellowstone trip, but keto never made it. And then number eight, August the 30th, last text from Gabby's phone, uh, no service in Yosemite. And okay. uh, that's kind of weird there. Maybe he gave her phone away to somebody. Uh, yeah, that's weird. Uh, and then um, number nine, uh, September the 11th, Gabby Petito's mom uh, contacts the police to report her daughter missing. And then number 10, September the 11th, couple's van is impounded by Florida police. The van was actually in Gabby Petito's name, not Brian Laundrie's name. After, you know, after Brian Laundry returned home and then the police really dropped the ball like they should have had that house under surveillance. But uh, and then um, number 11, September the 17th, Grand Teton National Park Rangers look for missing Gabby Batito. So they started the search on uh, September the 17th. On September the 8th, Northport police search for Brian Laundry and Vast Carlton Reserve. That's that swamp. That he supposedly hit out in but i don't think he did i think he knew that his car and his cell phone be tracked he left his wallet his cell phone at home with his parents he left the car at the carlton reserve and then his parents had it towed back and then the police impounded it searching for evidence and then they returned the the mustang and uh i believe he hitched a ride he had a history of hitching rides with people and offering money for rides so if you found the right person, you know, and this was before the case was relatively nationally known and before he became a wanted fugitive, he could have easily hitched a wide and within a couple of days been halfway across the country. So he could, in theory, be anywhere. And then on September 18th, uh, Northport police search for Brian Laundry to Bass Carlton Reserve. Yeah, that's... Um, Sorry, I'm repeating myself here. And then, sorry, number 13 on September the 19th, the FBI announced they have found human remains that match description of Gabby Petito at Spread Creek Ranch Campground. And then uh, number 14 on September the 20th, FBI raised uh, Laundry's family home and parents led outside. So... I think he's in the Appalachian Trail. Um, I think he's on the East Coast. You know, it starts in Georgia and it goes all the way up to New York. And I think he's in the Appalachian Trail. I think he might be there. I know that there was a member of the FBI. Let's see. Okay, I'm gonna. Um, I'm gonna share another screen here. You see that? Yep. Somebody in Brian Laundry's inner circle could be helping him, says former FBI agent. Ex FBI agent said that there might be digital evidence that could help. Mr. Laundry's whereabouts. Yeah, but I, he hasn't been active on his social media. So if he does create new social media, he's going to do it under an alias. So I don't know if you remember, there was um, that case where There was a case like uh, back in the late 90s, Brian, uh, Eric Rudolph, he's an extreme right winger. He did the Olympic bombing in the 1996 Olympics, and they were able to, through evidence, um, find out who did it. And he went into hiding, you know, and he was an expert outdoorsman and he hid for five years, but 
eventually he ran out of supplies and he got caught. Eric Rudolph got caught because he was starving to death. And so he ended up going through a dumpster looking for food and somebody called the police on him. And then the police found out it was Eric Rudolph that they had caught. He's serving life in prison. But so I predict that he might, you know, if he does have support from one of his buddies, he might be laying low for a while, but he is um, eventually going to get caught. Um, I think he's probably camping out in Appalachian Trail, to be honest, because he he's been able to do that for months at a time. But he'll eventually get caught when he needs to buy supplies, because eventually his money's going to run out. His food supply is going to run out. And he's going to have nowhere to go. He's got no ID, no money, nowhere to go. He can't even use social media without getting caught. So unless he does it under an alias and he didn't, I don't even think he has a computer or a cell phone with him to even get on social media. So I think he's hiding out in the Appalachian trail. I would say like Georgia, South North Carolina, somewhere around there. That's just my personal opinion, but we got about three minutes left. So any final words on the updates of the Gabby Petito case, Daniel? Um, I think, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. They're, they're going to catch him eventually. He's going to run out of supplies eventually, right? Yeah. I mean, because logically, you know, through logical deduction, um, and I can understand, uh, you know, you know, you got to corner all theories, you know, that, you know, he either committed suicide or um, he's on the run. Uh, really, those are the only two options. And I don't think he committed suicide because he showed a determination for survival. And he came back to Northport, Florida in a hurry because he needed to regroup and figure out what his next plan of action was. He was, oh. he was la last seen by his parents in the Carlton Reserve where he left his Mustang and disappeared. But I think he hitched a ride from there. Anyway, go ahead. Also, you know what? There are some people who are defending Brian Laundry and saying like, it's actually her fault because she's actually abusive because they found, they found, they got into a lot of fights and. Um, um, uh, she defended herself. It, it, the abuse was the other way around. If you listen to the, the phone call, I've listened to the phone call, the witness who called 911 on August the 12th, 2021, over in Moab, um, Utah. Um, they said that he saw a guy slapping a girl. So if you're getting slapped around, you're gonna defend yourself. So he's gonna get some cuts on him because, and maybe he was trying to strangle her then and she scratched him in, in defense. So I don't think that's that clear cut and dry, but where are you hearing this from? What's your source on that? Well, I was talking to a couple of friends of mine, and that's what they told me, like, you know, and some. Um, they sound I mean, like douchebags because they, you know, to me, that sounds like a bunch of douchebag. That's a very douchebaggy opinion, because if you look at the, you, I, I, I implore you to look at the uh, body cam footage. It's like um, an hour and a half long. It's really long. I, I fast forwarded through the slow parts, but the parts that I saw, um, she was crying and she was obviously distraught. And she had, I, I think she had red marks around her neck at that time. And there was other videos and photos showing bruising on her back. So she had been abused for a while. And yes, he had scratches on him, but I think those were defensive because he was trying to attack her and he was slapping her and she was defending herself by scratching him. And so I just, you know, I say, look at the evidence. The evidence points that he was an abusive prick. Yeah. Uh, she revolved her entire life around him. From what I understand, they had only one cell phone, one laptop, and he was also threatening to leave her in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, and he locked her out of her own van. That's not cool. That's her van, not his van. They weren't married yet. Uh, there's also rumors that, that she had, they had put off their engagement because of problems in the relationship. So it was definitely... Um, Mel, you know, it was definitely, he was definitely very controlling, very manipulative. He was good at manipulating people. He manipulated the police and he was laughing like a psychopath. So um, 
I think the evidence Wait, overwhelmingly he, points he in his direction him. and because he's on the run and he knows that he is wanted. But anyway, that's he it. I got to go. Where time is uh -huh. up. Thank you, Daniel, for joining me. Thanks for listening. This is The World is a Mess, and I just want to steampunk it. Episode 39. You have a nice day, and I will see you 25 billion years. I will.